You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing today? Do you know, two people have stopped me this week to say, is it... Does all that stuff really happen to you that you talk about on the podcast? Yes, I couldn't make this up. It's just me. I am like Miranda sometimes with stuff happening. A couple of other things that happened. Somebody said to me, when was it? Friday. They were talking about my running. They've obviously seen me out and they said, oh, you do run very slow, don't you? You're not a fast runner. I thought that was quite offensive, but never mind. I just laughed my way through it. I mean, they are speaking the truth, but really, I'd prefer it if they could say, you know, my goodness, are you going to enter the Olympic soon? Because you're so good. But, uh, no, anyway, that was the truth. And yesterday I was out gathering wood. I went on my run, or should we just say a, a fast walk? And it was after all the snow had cleared up, then there'd been a storm And in the road, there was all this wood. And I was fearful of cars coming along and having accidents because there was so much wood. So I was running along collecting sticks. And this one car drove past. Uh, You know, were they going to say thank you ever so much for for collecting sticks and helping save our vehicle? No, they looked at me as if I was the mad stick woman of the Shire. And I did take a photo. And if I remember, I will post it on the Facebook group. So there we go. But enough about me and my nonsense. Let's talk about books because I've got some great books for you this week. Really have. So the books I'm going to review include The Ugly Truth by Elsie North. And the author's coming on to talk to us about that book. Next is These Streets by Luan Goldie. And Luan's coming on as well. I'm reviewing The Space Between Us by Doug Johnston, End of Story by Louise Swanson and Harlan Coben's latest I Will Find You that I read on the Kindle, don't you know? So those are the books this week. Let's buckle up and get stuck straight in. So first of all, The Ugly Truth, Elsie North. Let me let me find you the blurb on this book and then I will read it to you. Melanie Lang has disappeared. Her father, Sir Peter Lang, says she is a danger to herself and has been admitted to a private mental health clinic. Her ex-husband Finn and best friend Nell say she's been kidnapped. The media will say whatever gets them the most views, but whose side are you on? Hashtag save Melanie, hashtag help Peter. And let's get the first few sentences read by the author now. Melanie Lang video one of nine published on Melanie Lang YouTube channel on the 2nd of August 2022. I'm Melanie Lang. Today's date is the 17th of June 2022. I can't give you any proof because I have no access to the news. The only reason I have a phone is because it was smuggled to me earlier this week. I'm recording this video from the bathroom of the house I've been locked in for the last four months. I've got the shower running and I'm whispering, but I need to be quick. There's a guard in the next room. No lock. This is the only room in the house with a door. This is the only time I'm ever alone. I love this book so much. It had everything I wanted in it. I didn't know what was going to happen. I cared and I wanted to know. It had different forms of media in. It just takes you by the sort of the scruff of your neck and brings you on this journey. It's a great sort of modern story. I think if you've loved the appeal, if you if you like social media, even if you don't, you're trying to work out more about it. It's just it's a great read. And it's not all social media, so don't think it's all of that. But there are comments and different messages. But there's the story, there's interviews, there's everything. It's it's a really good read. Bravo. And let's go and talk to the author now. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast Elsie North, whose latest truly fabulous book is The Ugly Truth. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Philippa. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm such a fan of your podcast. Oh, well, I'm such a fan of this book. This oh, kept thank you. me gripped. Now, let's let's start. Some people may not know you as Elsie North. Some people may know you as Lauren North. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I am Lauren North and I write psychological suspense slash thrillers as Lauren North. And I've recently branched out to also write 
what you would call book club thrillers as El Sinor. This is a, a genre I hadn't I hadn't really clocked before today. Me neither. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole new phrase. Let's start with the basics. Can you describe a bit about this book? I certainly can. So the novel is told all through mixed media and it follows the life of Melanie Lang, who is Britain's most famous celebrity. Um, she disappears from the public eye after her birthday celebrations end in chaos. And four months later, secret videos emerge of Melanie claiming she's being held prisoner by her father, business tycoon Sir Peter Lang. But Sir Peter says that Melanie is safe and well in a private mental health facility. So the nation becomes completely gripped with whose side are you on? Who do you believe? Are you hashtag save Melanie? Hashtag help Peter? Netflix commission a documentary and everyone Melanie's ever known has their two cents to say about it. So yeah, it was such an exciting book to write. (laughs) And I love the different media, the interviews, the YouTube commentary, blogs, comments. Was that easier to write or harder? Well, I think it's a bit of both, actually. I personally really love it. So I love that you can create this other this feel of other types of media, like um, the tone of an email. It's sort of a um, there's lots of different ways you can get across things without actually saying anything. But there's no way to describe anything. So I can't describe what a room looks like in an email or what someone's wearing, for instance, in the documentary. Um, It just isn't covered. You have to find other ways to paint the character and the picture that you want the reader to see. So it's it's difficult in some respects, but personally, I find it quite good fun, actually. Uh, which, But I do write in both still. I think I write one like this and then I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go write chapters yeah. now and describe people. And then I'll go back and I'm like, oh, no, this is brilliant. I can do a text message thing now. So, yeah, I like I like both. And I really enjoyed reading some of the comments people put on posts because you get the people, as you say, in favour of what's been written or very much against it. And some people are can be quite nasty as is in the real world it's it can be an extreme way of showing what the nation is thinking places like social media but it's really important in these types of books to keep pushing the story forward always and even though it's really interesting to hear what the nation's thinking it doesn't actually keep the story going so you can often lose momentum if you see mixed media in novels that are just people's point of view so it's it's a balance I, I loved it I loved the OMFG comments and oh it's a it's all a hoax kind of thing there's always someone who thinks it's an alien abduction as well which I just love Um, so you can get a real sense and I think we we all spend a lot of time on social media so we all get we can all be like oh that's that person that everyone will hate and that's that person people really like so it's there's so much you can do with it but push the story forward is always what I'm trying to say yeah and that makes sense actually because you there were the comments but there weren't lots of them and so it did yes it just gave me a flavor of what the nation was thinking Mm. but then I moved on we're not going to give any spoilers away but you it's a book that keeps you gripped to the end it's fair to say good (laughs) thank you (laughs) did you know how it was going to end before you started writing it or was it a revelation for you as well? Most of the time I will know exactly how the book's going to end and this was one of those occasions where I had an idea of how it was going to end and I got to the end and I just knew it didn't have the impact I needed it to have and it, it just wasn't tying the story up as well as I needed it to so I then sort of scrapped it and came up with something else as after I'd written it that felt much more true to the story honestly this is so crazy I'm kicking myself because I have another ending that could have gone there now as well and I'm like oh I could have put that in and it's too late and that's never happened before because once the book's done you're like well well it's done now but now I'm like oh I want to go back and rewrite it oh that's interesting so invite yes there could be the uglier truth <laughs> Yes. <laughs> or, or two different coloured books with two different endings. As, yes, uh, I know. I could sneak an extra one in, couldn't I? And people would be like, oh, what about this ending? They'd, they wouldn't know which they were talking about. <laughs> and so had this been a story that was sort of bubbling away and you really wanted to write as you'd been doing your sort of usual psychological thrillers? Um, no, not at all, actually. What happened was in 2021... 
I was early in 2021, I was in a really fantastic position of having written my last Lauren North thriller, All the Wicked Games, uh, which didn't come out until 2022. So I was really ahead of the game. And I had, I was out of contract. So that means that I didn't have to supply anything particular to the publisher. I, I had a bit of freedom to, and I had a bit of time. So I thought, well, I'll just explore something else now. I'll just just put the brakes on psychological thrillers and I'll just have a little think about what would be fun. And I just watched a documentary, which was a BBC panorama documentary about the Dubai princess, Princess Latifah, who was claiming in secret videos that her father was keeping her prisoner. And he was like, no, it's all lies. And it fascinated me, this concept of a really powerful man saying, no, ignore her. And this poor woman who, you know, was hiding in a bathroom saying, I have being trapped um and so that happened and then also at that time there was this huge movement on social media about Britney Spears and the free Britney movement and there was a documentary coming out about her and I think those two concepts collided in my head and when I came I remember very vividly sitting down at the kitchen table with my post-its getting ready to think about what my next book was going to be and this is what came out it the hashtags save Melanie help Peter were just like the first things I wrote um, and it just it grew from there and, and I've I've grew up in a world of Hello Magazine and Now Magazine and blogs and I've grown up with all these celebrities and seeing Britney Spears' rise to fame and then some of her mental health problems play out and it's just it really struck a chord with me as I look back now as a young woman growing up with watching it at the time versus who I am now looking back so I hopefully have captured some of that in um, the story. So now when there's a new documentary are you there sitting there with your notepad and pen ready for the inspiration <laughs> for the next story? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'll always, I normally have the idea first and then I'll look at what documentaries then might might come in. So uh, yeah, I've been watching some really interesting ones for the next book, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> Is that going to be an Elsie North next book? Yes, yeah, so I'm currently in structural edits, uh, which means that I have written my next Elsie North book and I'm now working to polish it. So that's where I'm at with it. So that's coming out in 2024. Excellent. Very good. Now, you mentioned post-it notes, which uh, I love a, mm -hmm. a post-it note. So is that how you go about writing and that's part of your process? Yeah, it's a very big part of my process. I am now completely obsessed with post-it notes. I actually did a course on how to use post-it notes to plan what? books and write books by Julie Cohen, who's a fabulous author. And she is a really fantastic creative writing teacher as well. And she runs a course, which is still available. You can watch it anytime um, on using post-its. And I, I signed up thinking, well, I, I'm a real planner. So I'm intrigued by this. And she sold it to me. So I am all in for the post-its. And I have colour coordinated post-its. And I, it's all over my wall now. I can look at it right now and just see <laughs> this is the next book. And it's going to be, it's just great. It's really great motivation for me both to be able to see it visually on the wall. And it's just so easy to move around yeah I'm, I'm a big fan but I would absolutely recommend Julie's course to anyone who's thinking of planning books and how they might go about doing it I've made a note of that that sounds absolutely terrific you use it visually as well and then you're changing the different series of events to get to that real sweet spot yeah, so it just sort of runs down the wall with post-its in how the book, this, each scene has a post-it, if you like. And then as I'm writing, I can then just move the scenes around on where they need to be. It's really easy. You can just pull one off and throw it away. You can add another one in. They're just, they're brilliant. This is just literally scratching the surface of what Julie Cohen can teach you with this course. So don't, don't take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> So when the doorbell goes and it's the postman with a deliver a large delivery from WH Smith, are your family like, oh, here we go. There's another book starting. Yeah, post-its and pens. I've got a whole drawer <laughs> of pens in different colours as well. Just a notebooks, <laughs> any any kind of merch I can get my hands on to make it a bit more fun when you're spending 12 hours a day doing something. <laughs> this main character, Melanie Lang, did she stay with you after you'd finished writing it. Yeah, and she's still, I feel, someone who's with me now. I think there are some books that you write and you can just move straight on and forget about them. And there are some characters who just stay with you. And, and Melanie's one of them. And in fact, when I talk about Melanie and Peter, 
I feel almost like I'm talking about real people to me. They 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 live inside me and they're as real as most people are, which is a bit batty, but it's <laughs> how it is. So yeah, she she really struck a chord with me. And she isn't Britney Spears and she isn't any particular celebrity. She's just a woman who's been thrust into the spotlight at 15 years old. She was a model and then she becomes Britain's most recognised celebrity because the media just become obsessed with her. And what I've done in the telling of her story is captured, I think, key moments in a lot of celebrities' lives. I think if you read it, maybe you'll notice this, Philip, but there were like stories that you think, oh, yes, I remember when that happened to such and such. So there are little things that it, it feels, I hope, to people of like my generation quite familiar, I think. And how you see something in the news and you think, right, well, that's how that happened. Or you read about it in a magazine. But actually there could be a different story, a different side to it, and actually a different truth to what happened. Absolutely. And that's really one of the things I wanted to capture, this concept that um, there are photographs called money shots where the paparazzi take a photo that's worth a lot more money than any other type of photo. And so a money shot is a really famous celebrity who's looking really angry or doing something wrong and they're, they're worth so much more money. So the paparazzi make more money and that's great because that's how they make their living. So for them, they want those money shots. And if one of the money shots is someone looking really angry, then a group of paparazzi surrounding a celebrity could make them angry. You know, these so we we put celebrities on pedestals and then the national media like to then pretty much throw rocks at them and try and knock them down again, in, in my opinion. Just seeing them get upset and angry because they're just trying to go to the shop. They're normal people. They, they have to go shopping. We all have to buy things. Um, and they're trying to go to the shops and suddenly they get surrounded by paparazzi. And of course, they're going to be fed up and angry and then they're going to get the money shot. So it's it's a really weird system. And it's, I you know, I, I'm very careful not to blame the media because the media is feeding what we are interested in as a society. So as a society, we are driving the media who are driving the paparazzi. This is this is the weird culture that we live in which is pretty balmy but you know I, I love celebrity gossip as much as the next person so and the point as well about how you just need to blink and the photographer could take the photo at that point and make you look like you've you know had a drink or something like oh that. yeah absolutely we all like now we've got phones we all can take 10 different photos of ourselves can't we we all take more than one if someone wants you to take a photo on the street you're like oh I took five because you always want the right one don't you and they just don't get that opportunity which you know it's really hard it seems to me that you really love writing that you really enjoy it am I right or is it actually harder than oh no I, I'm absolutely obsessed with writing it's all I want to do I work at the weekends as well and people hear that and think oh god that sounds really awful it's all all I want to do you know a perfect day for me is one where I've written my books and haven't had to do much of anything else so yeah I, I'm at it every day and it just makes me really happy although my husband will tell you that I sometimes aren't aren't too happy yesterday was um be upset about my structural edits but like I don't think I can do it but that was yesterday and today's today but okay. <laughs> you have to have that moment I suppose to sob and then move forward exactly it's, it's a bit of a roller coaster but I feel like you know I'm now six years into this career I guess from when my debut The Perfect Betrayal came out and I feel like I'm a lot more level-headed with how the roller coaster is now you know there are certain points in books where you start to worry that you've you've got nothing and it's normally about 30,000 words that you start to really panic um, and that is something I now know and can accept it, expect it and accept it. But have you ever had that 30,000 word panic and it and it proved correct that there wasn't any more of the book or has it just been a hump you've got to work through? Oh, no, I have re I have dumped some books. And I think as I've got, like I said, now I've been in it a little while, I'm a bit more wary of when I start books. I really plan them now and make sure that I can see the full story and that it has a commercial hook as well. You know, I'm a commercial fiction author. My job is to sell as many books as I can sell. And I, I want to write a fantastic story and I, I want to entertain myself and I want to entertain people, but it's my job to sell books. So I am always thinking about, is my hook strong enough to in a, in a market where there's so much competition and not just competition with other authors I think it's really important to recognize that my biggest competition is actually streaming sites 
phones, people's really busy lives. You know, I'm not really, I'm not competing at all with my friends and other authors. I'm competing with someone who's going to scroll through TikTok for half an hour because actually we all do that and it's quite nice. I I can lose hours of my life to social media and (laughs) I should be reading a book. I mean, I'm interested because the first series of books that I remember having some social media in were Cara Hunter's crime series, Alex um, Foley. But then, of course, there's the the big The Appeal book by Janice Hallett that seemed to really push this medium into the limelight and and it's become so popular. Is that a a good thing or do you find yourself, is it? Is it a genre? You know, I know you said book club thrillers, but is the sort of the appeal becoming a genre? There's nothing wrong with that, but is that good or bad? Yeah, I don't know, actually, because mixed media, it is a certain style and but it can be in lots of different genres. So Daisy Jones and the Six isn't a thriller. Yes, that's a good example. It's an absolutely fantastic example of mixed media. I mean, I read The Appeal after someone said to me, oh, your book's quite like The Appeal meets Britney Spears. That was Jack Jordan who quoted me on that because it's so lovely. Um, And I was like, oh, I better read it. And it was fantastic. And it's exactly that same style of the whole book being told in this medium. But it's not a medium that everyone's going to enjoy. Uh, I have had lots of feedback feedback saying they've loved it and I've had other feedback saying I just couldn't engage with the character so I think it is going to be a genre we're going to see a lot more of because we as readers are now so used to being on our phones all the time you know we never switch off from our emails from whatsapp from messages it's a way of communicating that we are all completely immersed in in our lives every day and so to read a book in that same format is just like being on our phones which is one of the another reason I really love to do it because I'm hoping to tap in to um, nudge out the way those phones I'm like oh I'll yeah. just read the book instead and I think you're right because yes you can get your sort of your fix from reading the book but also you get the story and it is a page turner mm. it really is oh thank you. you just kept wanting to find out what happened and get to the end and it's a book that although I could read quite quickly and I don't mean that in a bad way because it kept me gripped it's a book that is still with me it's going to stay with me for oh thank you that's so kind yeah I, it is a quick read actually I think because of the the style you can write race through it there's no chapters um and it was quick to write as well and, and I think that that's captured in just the pace of, of how we do scroll through our phones all the time as well yeah I think that's probably a, a good selling point for me that you can you can dip in and out uh, you know you don't have to be reading for hours on, at night because some of the uh, mixed media formats are like really short you might just get two emails and then you're moving on to something else absolutely now the last question Lauren and this is the the most vital one oh, gosh. what is your biscuit of choice what biscuit is powering the writing of your books oh dear so this is where I have to confess that currently and I'm not saying I'm sticking with it but currently I don't have any sugar in my life <laughs> My goodness, Lauren, I quaked someone dull 999. I'm in week two, so I can't say I'll stick to it. I mean, what's weird is if you'd caught me two years ago, I I was on three Twixes a day. But does a Twix count as a biscuit? That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to accept that as a biscuit, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it, it would normally be a Twix or a Rocky something that's... I like caramel, a biscuit and chocolate, and I need it to be substantial enough to dip into my coffee so I'm quite specific but of this current week so I'm talking about I'm desperate for a biscuit now oh, no. I'm just... <laughs> so you're going completely sugar free at the moment yeah I'm just trying it because it's supposed to be really good for your energy levels just to have a much more level energy and I've really noticed the difference as well actually in that I don't feel so tired in the afternoons if I have less sugar in my diet so I sort of have this slump often at like three o'clock where I need to I feel like I want to have yeah. a lie down and then often we'll then just or have more twist. sugar yeah exactly and <laughs> yeah. it's a bit of a cycle so I just got caught into it because my cousin was doing it um she was a nutritionist she's like come and do it I was like all right then <laughs> so I had a, a headache for three days though so I, I wouldn't recommend it to start with <laughs> has it affected your writing in any way has it made it easier harder not at all no nothing nothing affects the writing to be honest just keep no. the focus very good and we'll keep the focus <laughs> reading the book Elsie North whose latest amazing book is The Ugly Truth thank you so much oh thank you so much bit of a Coming up, one more author interview and more book reviews. Let's go on to the next book, These Streets by Luan Goldie. You know me, I love Luan's books. I think they are so 
of this time and the characters are, are just so interesting. It's well written. It's got the pace. I think they're phenomenal. And, and this was just as good. These straights. Let me do the blurb for you. Amidst the hustle and bustle of East London, these people are trying to hold on to hope in an ever-changing world. Jess is a single mother to two teenagers. All her energy goes into keeping them safe and happy. Being faced with eviction is a setback she wasn't prepared for, but Jess never lets circumstances dent her optimism. Hazel is Oxbridge bound and ready to fly the nest, but she's tired of being treated like a child. It's no wonder she can't tell her mum, Jess, the truth about what she's been up to lately. Ben has recently moved back to East London with just his faithful dog Harold for company. When he meets Jess, he realises they've crossed paths before, but can he keep this connection hidden from the woman he's starting to fall for? As the world continues to turn, these ordinary people will soon realise that, even with everything around them changing, the whisper of hope remains. Oh, isn't that, isn't that good? And let's get the first few sentences read by the author now. Chapter one, Jessica. April. He sent you a message, wants to meet up. Which one? Jess leans over her daughter's shoulders and peeks at the screen. Oh, that one, wants to meet. What in real life? Obviously, Hayes says. That's how it works, mum. Jess feels slightly put out by how comfortable her 18-year-old is swiping for men online. How often do you do this? I hope you're not meeting anyone in real life from this website. Hayes laughs, that kind of pity and chuckle she emits when Jess does or says something embarrassing. What can I say? I loved this book so much. You learn things, you laugh, you you feel for them. It's There's so much in it. It's, yeah, it's um, really quite a beautiful book. Let's go and talk to the author now. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Luan Goldie, whose latest truly fabulous book is These Streets. Luan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's great to talk to you. Let's start with the real basics. Can you tell us a little bit about this book? OK, so this book, These Streets, it's set in East London, particularly in Newham, Stratford, which is even though a lot of people might not have been, it's not the sort of place you visit. It is famous because it was one of the places that the 2012 Olympics were held. So in Stratford, we've got the amazing velodrome. If you're into cycling, we've got the aquatic centre. And then there was lots of other non-sports things which came with the Olympics. Like we have an airport here, 20 minutes from my house. There's an international <laughs> airport, um, Westfield Shopping Centre. So there's loads of fabulous stuff in Newham as a borough, but it's also one of the poorest boroughs in the UK. We've got really high levels of child poverty and we have really, really high levels of homelessness and long housing waiting lists. So I wanted to write a book about how those two things sit together, but it's not really a political book. It really follows one family, one mum and her two teenage children and how this affects her life. So it's a big story, I guess, but we see it through the eyes of a small, a small part, um, a small family, a normal family. And I love this with all your books for me, that it always covers various important themes, as you say, in this one, sort of housing trauma, all, all sorts. But you do it in a way you're not telling us you do it through the characters and their lives. Is that something you're really passionate about? I just think it makes sense because, I mean, we're all sitting watching the news, especially at the moment with the cost of living crisis, you know, and you hear it so much. You hear that phrase so much. It stops meaning anything and the housing crisis and housing waiting lists. It doesn't really mean anything. So you've got to tell these stories from a, a person's real point of view and show their real life. I want people to read this book and feel like, oh, I relate to this family. This could happen to me. Do you know what I mean? This could happen to me because that is what's happening. Um, Jess in the book, you know, she's she's working. Um, she feels like she does everything right. On paper, she does all the right things. And the idea of being homeless, it's like she's aware of it, but it's something that shouldn't affect somebody like her, right? And we all think that, oh, homelessness, it's terrible, but it's not something that would affect me. You know, I go to work, I do this, I do that. But the point is, it could and it is happening to lots of people who, who didn't expect it. So, um, yeah, I guess I try to do that in the writing to show it's not a problem for somebody over there. It's something that could happen to me. So I need to be aware of what it means. 
And it would be wrong for me to say, how did you get the idea for this book? Because, as you say, we are faced, we, we you know, we can see the problems that, that are going on in our society at the moment. So I suppose my question instead is, how do you choose which of the ingredients to put in this recipe? How do you choose what to pick out of what's going on at the moment? Yeah, it's really hard because you don't want to... Um try and squeeze so much in. There's so many other complex issues around housing that I would like to have explored, but they just weren't appropriate to Jess's story, I guess. And it was hard because when I was researching the book, I heard so many people's stories and I was still working in primary schools in East London at the time and hearing stories from some of our families, what they were going through. And it's complicated, you know, everyone's story is so different. There are lots of reasons and yeah, but I just wanted to tell Jess's story as I saw it and, and make it truthful. I think it seems to me that primary school teachers particularly do seem to, I don't know, you just involve much more with children and children's lives and they'll talk to you more. So you see much more. I read about teachers having to buy toothpaste and toothbrushes for children. And, you know, you mm-hmm. did you... It's not that you got your ideas from the work that you were doing, but it must have informed you as you went along. I guess so. I guess so. But more than that, I want it to feel real and not grim. Like, Mm. I don't like sort of gritty kitchen sink drama. (laughs) Do you know, I'm not into doing that, especially because I write about East London in two of my books and I write about working class people. But I don't want to play into that everything's so terrible, our life's so hard and we're poor, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to do that. I want to show like a lot of the joy and the hope about these people's lives. That's really, really important to me as a writer. So when you're asking me about if school and seeing some of those, because yeah, we do hear and see some bad things um, when you're working in primary, but I don't want to show just that. It's I don't want to hold it up and say, look how hard our lives are. Because it's not about that. It's like, oh, look at all this joy. And, you know, even in the book, you see Jess, she's facing all these huge, horrible things. But at the same time, she's a normal person. So you see her like laughing with her dad and arguing with her kids and bickering with her son. And it's stuff that we can all relate to. So I want to give a rounded view of things. You know, I've worked in schools in South London and East London and there have been a lot of hard things, but you spend most of your time in school just laughing. Uh, do you know what I mean? And yeah. there is a lot of warmth in it. So it's important for me to get that across just as much as the hardship. Yes, of course. And those characters, these wonderful characters, do they stay with you when you finished writing? Do you know with my first book, they really, really stayed with me, the characters. They felt so real. Um, but I think I move on from them quicker now. And I'm not sure, maybe it's because of how much more I'm writing, but I feel like once the book is finished or once the short story is finished, I sort of say goodbye to them. (laughs) I believe they go off and live their own lives and it's a happily ever after. Yeah, and I do sort of move on from them. Oh, that's so sad. (laughs) Well, as you go on and more and more books, you know, you'd be weighted down (laughs) otherwise by all these people talking in yeah, your head maybe that's it <laughs> I think as well what your books show me is they're about ordinary people but nobody's ordinary everyone's got their own individual story to tell yeah of course we've all got so many stories but at the same, t- same time there's so many things that we can all relate to across the board across class and where we live and you know, this issue about areas being gentrified is is pretty universal. Mm. Most cities across the world, mm. they have this, these, you know, all oh, the nice coffee shops come and, you know, the young families move in. It's happening in cities all over the world. So it is a story that people can relate to. Mm. I'm interested in what writing means to you, because it is a way of communicating the themes that you're living and seeing in the news. But what, yeah. I should just put the question to you. What does writing mean to you? I don't know. I just can't. I I just always write. I've always been writing. It's just very normal to me to write things down and to work things out through writing. It's just second nature. I don't really know how to describe what it what it is. (laughs) So if you're not writing, it, it doesn't feel right. 
I find if I'm not writing, like if I'm really not writing, not if I go away for a week and don't write, if I'm really not writing, I'm more agitated, I guess. And there's not been many times when I haven't been writing because I do, I'll just fit it in. I mean, at the moment it's a luxury. I'm a full-time writer, I'm writing all the time. But maybe when I was at school, when I first had a baby, I wasn't writing. Yeah, I need to do it. Even if, and I'm not always writing like heavy, you know, things or working on a big book or whatever. I just need to scribble something down all the time. <laughs> and can you remember when that first happened, when you became a writer? What what was that moment? No, I can't. I can't because I was just always writing like as a kid, when I was a teenager, I was always writing something. And I used to do business journalism. So it's a completely different kind of writing. And yeah, at times that was a bit frustrating because it wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to write and then I sort of ended up in that. But yeah, I love writing. It's just, it's my normal thing. It's just what I, what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and do you love editing as much as writing? Hmm. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I do like editing, but sometimes... Do you know what? I hate that last stage, that very, very last stage, like your final edit on something. I find that just like, oh my gosh, I want to undo everything and start again. That is the really, really hard part for me. I do like editing, actually. Um, I'm editing some work at the moment as well as writing and it, it's really enjoyable. But that last edit's a killer. And sometimes a first draft, you know, usually I love doing a first draft, but this fourth book I'm finding very difficult to get the first draft out. I've restarted it several times. I've just junked loads of words, thousands, tens of thousands, if I'm honest, tens of thousands of words. And it's very difficult. So I'm not sure it seems to change with each book. It must be very painful when you're having to delete words that you've worked hard to create. Yeah, I don't know. I think last week and the week before, that's when I really got rid of a lot. And I felt relief oh. because I was just working on it. And it's like the word count was going up, but I knew it wasn't right. So when I finally was like, no, I've got to do it and ju just deleted loads, I actually felt better. And it's not lost. You know, I keep those words and maybe those characters and those um, subplots will come up in something else or maybe they're good for a short story but they weren't working in that novel at all <laughs> and do you enjoy the publication process as well or is that a nervous time for you hmm. they've all been really different so it's hard to give an answer to that I mean my first book came out and it was amazing you know when you're a debut author you get a lot of attention and a lot of people were talking about the book and it started to to build you know I was going on the radio and it was long listed for the women's prize and there was quite a bit of hype around it but then the second book came out in 2020 during um the pandemic so the bookshops had just reopened but it felt like look no one cares no one cares about the book even I to an extent was like I don't want to go online and shout about my book like there's bigger things going on so really really different experiences with those first two books um, so I don't know, the publication process, it's just, <laughs> you just don't know what to expect. And it's out of my control is the main thing. You know, you publish a book, it's just out of your control. If it's going to be in bookshops, if it's going to get coverage, if it's going to go in for prizes, all that stuff is out of my control. So I try not to focus on it too much. Not like with the first book when I was just <laughs> completely overwhelmed and like, oh my gosh, now I'm like, I've written the book. That that was my part of the job. Now it's out there. <laughs> Let's talk titles. So the, obviously this one is called These Streets. Was that your title from the beginning or were there options? I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I've not come up with any of the titles of my books. <laughs> um, it's really, really difficult. So with my editor and my agent, when I'm writing something in, and sending it to them, it's literally like, here's the novel or... <laughs> novel three <laughs> book three <laughs> yeah. and they'll be like any ideas for a title uh no have you got any ideas for a title it's so difficult and you know at the moment I'm um, a writer in residence a secondary school in East London and we're putting together an anthology which is amazing and then the students are all like so what's the title I said well it's up to you guys to come up with the title I'm thinking I don't have to deal with it and they cannot do it. We've got a working list of titles. It's like 18 ideas on it at the moment. And they're all looking at me and I'm like, I can't do titles. It's so hard because it's like all these words 
And then you're trying to condense it to a short little title to say what the book's about. I'm really interested, though, being a writing resident at a school. So are you writing your book while sitting at the school and they see you or are you writing with them? So it's an organisation called First Story. So they send professional writers into secondary schools and we run workshops with the students and the students write and then we create an anthology. So we we do the workshops and we edit it and put together the anthology. So this is my first year with them, but they've been running for 15 years so it's amazing because you've got all these young writers and they're all super different, you know. <laughs> Some of them are like, I only want to write horror. <laughs> Some of them want to write romance. Some of them want to write really literary, you know, prose. Some of them are poets. They're all completely different. But we're going to put together our an- our anthology. We're almost there. And are they all different ages of kids or is it a particular year that you focus on? Mine are year eight and nine mostly, but... Yeah, depends depends on the school. I think it's all through secondary. Some just have a bunch of year 11s, some might have year 10s. Depends on what the school wants. Mm. But it's great. It's my first year with them and I'm really enjoying it. It's the complete opposite because, I mean, obviously I was a primary school teacher for 10, 11 years. So I sort of went in like, yeah, I understand, understand schools. I understand writing. Let's go. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this is very different. <laughs> Obviously, teenagers and young people are are very, very different from primary school students. You need a completely different approach. So, yeah, it's been a a real learning curve, but it's great. That's fantastic. And have they asked you about your books as well? Do you get that sort of two-way relationship? Mm, Not really. They ask me quite, they ask me quite technical questions. They ask me about, they've asked me about word counts and, (laughs) you know, like things like who checks the spellings and, They've not really asked me much about the actual writing. It's, yeah, it's more like the technical side, which is interesting. But yeah, it's cool. It's, it's fun watching other people write. Oh, that sounds amazing. Before we send you on your way, we have one more question, the most important question on this podcast. Uh, what is your biscuit of choice? What biscuit is powering the writing of your books? Oh, well, do you know what? This month, it's been about custard creams. But I was at my (laughs) mum's yesterday. This is such a typical mum thing. And she gave me a packet of bourbon biscuits. And they were already open. Like, she wrapped them in tinfoil. And I totally forgot about them. And then I was walking this morning. And I was like, what is this sticking out my pocket? Packet of tinfoil wrapped bourbon biscuits. So I'll get stuck into those later. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. So normally it's a custard cream, but today it's a bourbon biscuit. you got to mix it up. (laughs) It could be a different story. Your writing could take a different turn as a result. It could be. It might influence me in a different way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Luanne Goldie, whose latest fabulous book is These Streets. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, let's go to the next book, which is I Will Find You by Harlan Coben. I have to say, I didn't even read the blurb of this book. I just love Harlan's books. And I thought I just want to read it and find out what it's about. But let me read you the blurb. I'm. <laughs> this is the first time I've read the blurb as well. Here we go. David and Cheryl Burroughs are living the dream, married, a beautiful house in the suburbs, a three-year-old son named Matthew, when tragedy strikes one night in the worst possible way. David awakes to find himself covered in blood, but not his own, his son's. And while he knows he did not murder his son, the overwhelming evidence against him puts him behind bars indefinitely. Five years into his imprisonment, Cheryl's sister arrives and drops a bombshell. She's come with a photograph that a friend took on vacation at a theme park. The boy in the background seems familiar, and even though David realises it can't be, he knows it is. It's Matthew, and he's still alive. Now let me read you the first few sentences. Here we go. I'm serving the fifth year of a life sentence for murdering my own child. Spoiler alert, I didn't do it. My son Matthew was three years old at the time of his brutal murder. He was the best thing in my life and then he was gone and I've been serving a life sentence ever since. Not metaphorically, or should I say not just metaphorically. This would be a life sentence no matter what, even if I hadn't been arrested and tried and convicted. I love this book so much. I was gripped. It was one I was thinking about when I wasn't even reading it. And I just, I just loved it. One of his best at the top. It's not part of a series, as far as I'm aware. It's a sort of a standalone one. Bravo, excellent, first class, first rate. 
there you go. Next one is The Space Between Us by Doug Johnston. Now, this is an Arenda book. So this is hashtag Team Arenda. I'm getting in my hashtags today. And I've seen that this is going to be covered on the Sarah Cox's Between the Covers BBC Two book club as well. So that's very exciting. Congratulations to Doug and uh, the team, Karen and the team at Arenda Books for that. Let me do you the blurb on this one. Lennox is a troubled teenager with no family. Ava is eight months pregnant and fleeing her abusive husband. Heather is a grieving mother and cancer sufferer. They don't know each other, but when a meteor streaks over Edinburgh, all three suffer instant catastrophic strokes only to wake up the following day in hospital miraculously recovered when news reaches them of an octopus-like creature washed up on the shore near where the meteor came to earth. Lennox senses that some extraterrestrial force is at play. With the help of Ava, Heather and a journalist Ewan, he rescues the creature they call Sandy and goes on the run. But they aren't the only ones with an interest in the alien. Close behind are Ava's husband, the police and a government unit who wants to capture the creature at all costs. And Sandy's arrival may have implications beyond anything anyone could imagine. Let's do the first sentence of this one. Chapter one, Lennox. He knew they were following him. A shift in the shadows as he entered Figgert Park. He pressed pause on the self-esteem track he was listening to, but kept the headphones over his ears. If he dropped them round his neck, they would know he was on to them. He kept his stride regular, changed his grip on the skateboard from the deck to the wheel axis so he could swing it better. What a book! Yes, there's elements of like E.T. Oh, the fond memories of watching that film for the first time. But then there's the relevance of all that's happening today. It's exquisitely written. It's, you, you know, just absolutely excellent and yes we've loved the scale series that Doug has written this is a standalone so different but shows the talent that he has as an author it's one of those memorable books it's one I think would be useful for a book club book because there's so many different not so many there's different angles that could could be great discussion points I thought it was yeah, really good. And now I've read the book and looking at the cover, I yeah, I like the cover even more. It's gorgeous. So, yes, bravo. Excellent. Very good. We're on to our last book. And the last book is End of Story by Louise Swanson. Once I heard about this book, I had to read it. Here we go. When all you've ever known is fiction, how do you know what's real? It's the year 2035 and fiction has been banned by the government for five years. Writing novels is a crime. Reading fairy tales to children is punishable by law. Fern Dostoy is a criminal. Officially, she is retrained in a new job outside of the arts, but she still scrawls in a secret notepad in an effort to capture what her life has become. Her work on a banned phone line reading bedtime stories to sleep-starved children. Hunter, the young boy who calls her and has captured her heart, the dreaded visits from government officials. But as Fern begins to learn more about Hunter, doubts begin to surface. What are they both hiding and who can be trusted? Let's do the first sentence. Is So Thursday, 1st of November, 2035, 8.24pm. If you tell a story well enough, it's true. This sentence came to me every time I started a novel. I typed it beneath whatever the working title was in that moment, an italicised reminder when I opened the document late at night to resume, coffee steaming on the desk nearby and a single cigarette waiting as a reward for hitting my word goal. Very Paul Sheldon. These nine words chided me while I ruthlessly edited every first draft, pruning flowery words, tightening passive verbs, moulding metaphors, letting my voice rise. These nine words forced me to address plot holes, character motivation, the denouement. Only when I finally submitted the manuscript to my publisher did I delete them. If you tell a story well enough, it's true. But I haven't written a story for a long time. Oh, gosh. I love a dystopian. I love a good dystopian. And that's exactly what this is. I've read, you know, the Memory Police, which sort of reminded me. It's not that book at all, but do you know what I mean? It just reminded me of it. The desperation, the the characters, the this expertly plotted, beautifully written. It's a first class piece of work. Bravo. And and those are your books. 
And I've got four minutes before I have to be recording another interview for next week. So I'd better go and hurry up. But I hope there's some books there. Let me do a quick recap. So we've had The Ugly Truth by Elsie North, These Streets by Luann Goldie, I Will Find You by Harlan Coburn, The Space Between Us by Doug Johnson and End of Story by Louise Swanson. Hopefully some great ones for you there. And I hope you're OK. I hope you're all right. Keep going. And oh, gosh, I can't wait to talk to you next week. So I've got some absolutely brilliant books to talk to you about. So just look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.